We are now broadcasting, which means that all the attendees are starting to come in and we are recording. Great, so thank you everyone. I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President and I'm really honored to be here and to honor the guests who are joining us today to talk about social workers and children. I have been calling for every school to have at least one social worker for a very long time. And when the fall semester resumes, if it does, when the classrooms are either in existence or online, it's clear that the pandemic and the economic aftershocks make the need for this change to have social workers in every classroom, one way or the other, more important than ever. I wanna start off by thanking the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at the NYU Silver School of Social Work and the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx for co-sponsoring this event, as well as our amazingly distinguished guests. I'll introduce them later, but one, Council Member Mark Traeger, who's Chair of the City Council's Education Committee, Jasmine Berrios, who is a LCSW, Licensed Social Worker and Program Director at Partnership with Children. David Garza, who's President and CEO at the Henry Street Settlement, Dr. Michael Lindsay, who's Executive Director of the McSilver Institute at NYU, and Hilary Koppel, who is a high school-based social worker herself. And I also want to thank Dr. Claire Green Ford, who's the Executive Director of the National Association of Social Workers in New York, because she has always been insightful and supportive of this issue of school-based social workers. I'm not going to say much because the speakers are phenomenal, but we know that as a nation, we have now suffered more deaths in the first few months of 2020 than the U.S. Armed Forces suffered in Vietnam over 15 years. And my husband, for your information, is a Vietnam vet. We know that there have been suicides of a doctor. We know that the children are suffering, and we'll hear more about that perhaps even more than the adults. We know that even during the COVID crisis, social workers have been helpful. They have been helpful on video chats, teachers, and they've made arrangements that have enabled students to finish their work and to pass their classes. So last year, working with Council Member Traeger, who has been so supportive of this issue, we did succeed, thanks to him, in obtaining funding to hire 200 new social workers and continued baseline funding for 85 workers who were hired the previous year. But they're stretched thin. We have 700 schools in New York with no full-time social workers. And with 78% of the city's school children economically challenged and 13% with learning English as a second language, if we think we needed social workers before, we sure need them now. So even having one social worker for every school doesn't hit the ASW metrics for having enough social worker. And of course, we have the budget issues. So we have a website, it's at manhattanbp.nyc.gov slash social workers that talks about some of these resources and some of these numbers that I've mentioned. And you want, want to sign up for our email that goes out every single day, it's simply manhattanbp.nyc.gov slash sign up. I do want to thank Luisa Lopez, who's here. I want to thank Noel Hidalgo for making this possible today, Shuler Warren Cooter from our office, and I never forget my friend, Rose Pierre Luis, who is at the McSilver Institute and former Deputy Borough President. So without further ado, I would like first to introduce Council Member Mark Traeger, who represents a section of Brooklyn. He speaks Russian. He uh, taught at New Utrecht High School, so he's a former teacher, and he is now the chair of the uh, Committee on Education. He also had experience with Hurricane Sandy. So this is the kind of person we want to have be part of this panel. So council member, go ahead and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Borough President. And, and I mean this, that you are one of the most in, engaged on the ground connected elected officials we have uh, in all of New York. And I mean that. And you have been on this issue from day one and uh, you amplified the voice, you amplified, amplified the urgency of the matter. And uh, so I cannot thank you enough for your partnership and leadership in the city of New York. I wanna thank, of course, all the fellow panelists and 
folks were with us from, from Nick Silver, a fantastic uh, group, Jasmine, David, Dr. Lindsay, uh, Hillary, everyone else, and Rose Pierre is a phenomenal uh, leader as well. Uh, just to give some context before we get right to this, to this uh, current crisis pandemic, um, in the last budget, uh, thanks to the leadership of uh, Borough President Gail Brewer and, and my, many of my council colleagues, we were able to prioritize uh, the hiring of uh, over 200 social workers. Uh, however, uh, we have learned that the DOE hired 175 of them and did not complete the hiring of 25. And that came to light in, in recent weeks. And we are demanding that they complete hiring of the 25 that was promised in the last budget and the need to hire a lot more moving forward. I wanna share quickly that when I first became chair of the committee, uh, one of the schools I visited first was Pan American International High School in Queens. The reason for my visit was because the first hearing I held was on the topic of renewal schools, which feels like decades ago. Uh, but I wanted to learn more about uh, how the school was using the added investments. It received 100% of its fair student funding. And it's important to share that the school wisely used the added resources to hire a bilingual social worker, understanding that the student population was already experiencing trauma uh, because of the, of the hostility coming out of Washington towards our immigrant communities. There were kids that were afraid to even uh, go play soccer after school, afraid to come to school to encounter an authority figure, um, afraid that it would compromise their family's immigration status. Well, that trauma affected their attendance. Attendance is a major, major indicator of trauma. It's a major indicator of a school culture. And uh, the social worker that was hired understood that she had to create a safe space, a sanctuary in the school community and the students shared just that. They said that before they would start their school day, they would check in with her. And she would quickly become a social worker, not just for, not, not just for the student, but for their families. And so one case becomes quickly five, six cases because each family needs help and support. But long story short, Borough President, um, that social worker and her impact led to the school's attendance to pick up and scores to pick up. And that school graduated out of renewal into RISE and showed progress. So I share this now because we have a student population in New York that was already traumatized before the pandemic, already experiencing inequities, inequality, homeless, over 100,000 students uh, who, who are homeless in New York. Uh, we have over 200,000 kids with IEPs who still have not gotten all the mandates and services w which they're, they're required to receive. We have immigrant students who are being traumatized, kids who live in poverty, kids who, who don't even have adequate hot water and heat uh, in, the, in their apartments, which I have to deal with in Coney Island, particularly in, in our NYCHA developments. So I, I share that because we, we have to bring this into context. We already had a traumatized student population. This pandemic has blown open that, that inequity even farther. It has exacerbated that inequity. It has exacerbated all of the trauma that are, and it's re-traumatizing kids. And I'll, I'll share with you some of the painful stories I've heard from educators and from, and, from, and from students. There was a high school senior who had just received, because this is during the time of a year when they get their college acceptance letters, a high school senior that's having difficulty adapting and, and adjusting. He lives in a crowded dwelling um, and uh, he's caring for sick loved ones. He got a letter that he was going, he's going to college, but he says, Mr. Traeger, you know, how can I care about going to college when my grandma doesn't feel well and, and she needs me and I'm here to help her and, and to support her. I have to help support my family to pay their bills because they're, they're falling behind on paying rent. These are one of some of the most painful stories you'll hear kids facing food insecurity. So what this school community did, they utilized, they happened to have a social worker, many schools still do not, but they, they, they uh, customized their approach by, by uh, becoming a, almost a case manager, helping them get more food for the apartment, providing uh, trauma-informed supports to the student to help stabilize that situation. But this is one of the many, many painful things that our students are experiencing. So the borough president is right. How can you think about reimagining schools or reimagining New York 
without fully funding them and fully funding an adequate number of social workers in every single school. That is non-negotiable. This is, I don't need any billionaire from, from any mansion or from Bill Gates. I don't need anyone to tell me that we need to make sure that every school has adequate number of social workers, counselors and supports for our kids. They are lifesavers. They transform and save lives every single day and they make a difference on their academic outcomes as well. So I will, I will pause here to let the other panelists speak, but Borough President, thank you for bringing this to light because this is, this is really the key difference and this will be my guiding principle in the budget fight ahead because I said in the budget hearing, those closest to the struggle must be farthest from the pain. That is my North Star. You're working with our kids. We must protect you and, and strengthen you to continue to serve our kids right now. Thank you, Borough President. Thank you very much. And we know why you're so good as being chair of the Education Committee. So Jasmine Berrios is the program director at Partnership with Children, which is an organization that is awesome. She's a psychotherapist and she is compassionate and she's got 15 years of experience providing leadership and direct service. As I said, she's program director of partnership with children and they have four community schools. She can talk more about them. And she also has a private uh, psychotherapy practice. And um, I'm delighted that you're here, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Go ahead, All the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so partnership, we actually, you know, have a, a number of community schools across the boroughs. Um, in my role as program director, I have four community, four community schools that I oversee, uh, two of which are in Manhattan and two, uh, one in the Bronx, um, and one school that's currently not a community, is a community school, but we're not the lead CBO at that school. Um, so, you know, I echo um, the comments that Council Member Mark Traeger just shared. Uh, and coming off the heels of that, when we talk about supporting our social workers, right? One of the things I really value about um, the community school model and partnership with children's model is that all of our social workers also receive regular weekly clinical supervision. You know, it's so, port so important to make sure that, you know, our social workers, our, so our social work directors, the folks that are on the ground doing the work that they are supported and that they are given the opportunity to share what's going on for them, have someone that they can consult with and discuss treatment plans, prevention needs, um, you know, additionally, making sure that they have access to trainings and ongoing professional development so that they are equipped to deal with the variety of issues that are going to be coming in, especially as we look into the fall and look into what's to come after this pandemic. You know, I also think that it goes beyond serving student and families, right? Our social workers on the ground really look to incorporate the macro, meso, and micro, right? Bridging that connection between community and school, identifying what those needs are, branching out, really getting a contextual view of what are the things that are impacting the student and this family, and ultimately impacting how they show up. Um, additionally, supporting the staff at the school, the teachers at the school, giving them opportunities to have professional development, um, helping to make that connection between the behaviors that they're seeing and understanding that this isn't a question of what's wrong with you. It's a question of what's going on, what's happening that has you showing up in this way. Um, and so in terms of thinking about best practices as we look to move forward, you know, a trauma-informed approach is really going to be um, a critical piece of that, um, that approach that we take as we move into the fall into working with our families. I also think that that work needs to start now. We need to start thinking about how we're going to be supporting, what things do we need to have in place, and that certainly includes thinking about how do we get the funding to secure the staffing that we need in the schools to make sure that we're able to do that. Um, okay, couldn't be said better. Um, so David Garza is president and CEO of Henry State Settlement. Um, they serve, it says here 50,000, but I think it's many more people every year. And certainly uh, I'm sure at this point it is many more. 
He was appointed uh, after being nine years at uh, settlement. He, I know that he's expert in everything, and he knows that I call him the rock star of the settlement house movement. No disrespect to all the other settlement house directors, um, but this particular Henry Street, I know, has wonderful arts. They have an amazing workforce development center, and of course, the reason he's here today is because of their deep, deep uh, work on the mental health community and all of the uh, school-based mental health clinics. So, and it's also on many boards. Um, so I'm here to say thank you, David Garza, for joining us. Thank you for all the work that Henry Street does under your leadership. I know there are many more accolades, but I'd love to hear more about what Henry Street is doing in terms of school-based and where you think it needs to go. You're muted. Um, you're muted, David. You need to. It's like taking the lens cap off before you take a photo, right? <laughs> um, I want to thank you, uh, Borough President, for all of your leadership. Uh, as Council Member said, you know you are everywhere. Uh, you are a champion, and you speak up uh, wherever possible for those most vulnerable and for where there's need. So I'm really proud and grateful to be on this panel and part of this conversation with all my fellow panelists. Um, I am the president and CEO of Henry Street Settlement. We are a 127 year old uh, poverty fighting and social service organization um, that comes into this uh, pandemic with a long history of serving the most vulnerable York New Yorkers in crisis. Uh, for all of us, uh, this is our first pandemic, but it's not Henry Street Settlement's first. Uh, we were in acute response uh, in 1918, and uh, we operate 18 program sites and serve 50,000 New Yorkers. And uh, we, our doors never closed, and they have not closed uh, during this crisis. Uh, we have eight sites still open, and we have a lot of remote activity uh, still happening, including our school-based mental health programs. Um, in, in, as a 127-year-old organization, we often look to our organizational DNA uh, to provide a North Star or a moral compass as to, as to how to uh, respond to need. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be founded by uh, an individual, a 26-year-old nurse named Lillian Wald, who had a profound impact uh, on the field of public health and the field of social services. And a lot of the essence in our um, mission is captured in a quote from Lillian Wald. And it's a, it's a, a simple but profound and powerful quote. And it, it simply says, in times of need, act. And that really defines uh, what a settlement is and that whenever we find a situation, a circumstance, a condition, or a group of people uh, that need support, uh, it's our responsibility uh, to act. And uh, she uh, utilize that to have, um, to really help create and define the field of public health. Uh, we were, uh, she was a nurse and uh, our founding service was knocking on doors to find out who needed primary health care and then delivering that service. And uh, all of her work in public health ultimately led her uh, to help put a nurse in every single public school. So uh, 127 years later, I am exceptionally uh, grateful to be part of a conversation that speaks to put a social worker in every single New York City public school because um, as the council member said, you know, in times of crisis, it's about protecting the, the highest priority needs of individuals and it doesn't have to be complex. It's basically making sure people have access to food, shelter and, and, and health. And, and everything else beyond that is everything else. And our families and our children have been in crisis long before uh, this pandemic. And so our commitment to providing health care, uh, including mental health care, uh, to our students is really embodied um, in the programming of school-based mental health workers. We presently operate uh, multiple schools uh, where we have school-based mental health social workers. Uh, we have PS20, PS134, PS140, PS142, uh, Orchard Collegiate Academy, uh, Manhattan Charter, University Neighborhood Middle, Middle School. Uh, we took over uh, some school-based mental health programs in uh, 2012. We, we took over three 
and we've now expanded um, that presence to uh, seven and then two, we, two schools have uh, 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 two levels. So we understand the importance and we understand the commitment uh, of this service um, as, a, as, a, as a basic component uh, to help not only um, serve children who have high need, but also to help them uh, you know, reach their full potential and also to be part of a, lar a larger conversation uh, to destigmatize mental health issues and to normalize uh, what treatment and support looks like. Um, you know, part of the settlement model is the fact that we're place-based and all of our services happen on the Lower East Side. And I think there's a very important parallel between being place-based and uh, school-based mental health workers in every school. And that's to meet children where they are. Um, there is no place where children spend more time than in school. There, uh, and that's, uh, that's true over the course of a day, that's true over the course of a year, and that's true over the course of their lifetimes. So it is only uh, natural and imperative that that is where you will reach the, student, the children, and that is where you will reach the parents, and that is where you will reach the teachers, and that is where you will reach their peers, because it is that, it is that constellation of stakeholders and of uh, people in our children and our students' lives who can inform and be part of the solution. And the clinical work of school-based mental health workers and social workers is part of the equation, but I, uh, I have to express that it really uh, takes all of those other components to be activated to help uh, lead children from whatever circumstances they're in uh, to success and, and to progress. And, the final thing that I want to say where I believe it really underscores um, the need to put a social worker in every school is that this is about a, a long-term relationship with therapeutic support. And without a social worker in every school, you run the risk of providing critical and valuable services to students over a period of time, whether they're in elementary school or middle school or high school. And if the, when they make transitions from one environment to the next, the, the, all of that work and all of that progress becomes at risk and at peril. It, every single one of our social workers and every single one of our team has seen students make extraordinary progress from the time they come into a school, years of working with the same therapist, years of making progress with the parent, years of making academic gains, years of making attendance improvement gains, years of making um, social emotional gains, and all of that becomes at risk when there is not uh, a place uh, to help make a warm transition to the next environment. So if you have a child in elementary school and then they go to middle school and there is no social worker, uh, all of that progress becomes at risk. So it's critically important uh, that we set up this uh, safety net with no room in between for children to fall through the cracks by putting a social worker in every academic environment where we find our children, because that's where they need it the most and that's where they need us the most. And so we are really grateful to be part of this conversation. And I look forward to hearing from the other panelists and to answering questions and to doing everything we can uh, to continue to raise awareness and put resources behind this extraordinarily important and vital service for our children and the families that we serve. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Lindsay, who is the Executive Director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at New York University. He's a scholar in the fields of child and adolescent mental health, as well as a leader in the search for knowledge and solutions to generational poverty and inequality. He is uh, also a professor at the School of Social Work at NYU and an Aspen Health Innovators Fellow. He works very, very hard at NYU to lead a university-wide strategy to reduce inequality initiative. And I said to him earlier that I really miss the wonderful in-person forums that the McSilver Institute has on these topics. So he leads a whole team of researchers, which is why we're so honored to have him today, and professionals who are committed to creating new knowledge about the root causes of poverty, developing evidence-based interventions to address 
consequences and rapidly translating these findings into action through policy and best practices. And I wanna say how important this is because I read the reports, this kind of support for all the work that's being done in the schools is invaluable. And uh, I know that the work that is being done is taken very seriously. So Dr. Lindsay, thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Borough President uh, Brewer. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to address uh, this issue. Um, you know, this really is a policy matter that must rapidly be translated into practice. So we're at a moment that is critical for the rapid translation of policy into practice. Um, you know, what we know is that, you know, mental health services and social workers and schools are incredibly critical. And obviously, they were critical before COVID, but obviously, uh, the COVID fallout is going to be tremendous in terms of food insecurity, uh, homelessness, uh, kids who have been impacted by domestic violence and other kinds of stressors in the home. And so it is critical that we ensure that these uh, schools are uh, equipped with social workers and other professionals that are going to meet the needs of kids, right? Um, what we know is that when school mental health services are co-located uh, and social workers are co-located in the schools where these issues that kids are going to be presenting with emerge, that kids are 21 times more likely to connect to school-based services before they go to community-based services. Kids and families are more likely to connect to school-based services. So it is critically important then that we provide that cadre of professionals to be available for kids in schools. What we also know is that schools are now the largest provider of mental health services uh, for kids receiving services in schools. And so if a kid has a mental health need, they're going to receive that, uh, those services in schools. Um, and, and, and social workers are the largest uh, providers of mental health services. We know this. Um, you know, when I became uh, executive director of the McSilver Institute uh, almost five years ago, one of my dreams uh, for the greatest city in the world, New York City, was to see that every school have a mental health provider or a social worker in the school, right? That was my, 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 my dream for the greatest city in the world. Um, and Madam Berto President, uh, you, you may remember uh, a few years ago, you invited the McSilver team to your office and you showed me something that I often talk about when I speak uh, around the country on this issue of school-based mental health. Um, you showed us a map of the, uh, the, the borough of Manhattan and we saw on that map where there was a relative dearth of mental health professionals and social workers in schools. And what we saw is that the schools that were in impoverished communities um, who had a majority population of black and brown kids did not have a social worker in schools. And you promised us that day, you said, I'm going to see to it that every school has a at least a social worker or a mental health provider to address the needs of the school. So I cannot thank you and Congress uh, uh, Council Member uh, Traeger enough for the work that you've been doing to ensure that the, the, the kids in New York City have access to services that are necessary for their emotional and psychological well-being. I want to close with two critical questions, though. One question is, and you've talked about this, uh, Borough President, um, uh, as well as, the, uh, as, as Council, um, Council Member Traeger, that is, is, is one social worker enough, right? Um, and what we should do is really think about the needs of kids, uh, the needs of schools, uh, and, and, and really try to ensure that uh, not just one social worker, but however many social workers and professionals are needed relative to the needs of kids in that school. Because we should not have any kid in need of support without the professional there to provide that support for them. And the other critical question I have is this. 
what happens when we provide social workers uh, to schools that uh, are, are, are in need of these kinds of services? What, what, how, how are those social workers going to deliver the work that is necessary to be done, right? And so to that end, we've been working at McSilver on a couple of things that are critical to this, this, this second question. One is that um, we have to equip the social workers and mental health providers with evidence-based practices, things that we know work relative to depression, anxiety, trauma, whatever the case may be. And we've been working with Scott Bloom and other folks uh, to ensure that uh, mental health providers, social workers in schools are delivering uh, evidence-based treatments for uh, issues like depression uh, in particular, but also trauma and anxiety. The other thing I want to mention is that we have a really incredible program at the McSilver Institute called the Step Up Program, where we provide mental uh, wellness and other supports to kids in schools. Uh, it is a model that we can train social workers on, or there's an example of a model that we can train social workers on to be able to be equipped with the strategies and skills that are going to be necessary to provide support to kids. And so what we do and uh, step up is we provide mentoring, one-to-one -one mentoring, and other kinds of enrichment and supports around their mental wellness to ensure that kids are connected to schools and receiving the support that they need. And so I just want to thank you again for your advocacy, uh, Borough President uh, Brewer, and, and your support for uh, schools and, and, and for social workers to be involved in schools, and for Council Member Traeger for your work because uh, again, if we don't provide these essential supports for kids, a lot of kids are gonna continue to struggle uh, beyond the magnitude of what impact uh, COVID has had on their lives. Well, thank you very much. I must be honest and um, that I worked for many years for Ruth Messinger, who is a social worker. She was in the city council way before you, uh, council member. And, um, I think she taught me a lot about the importance of social work and we still teach together. We teach every uh, semester at Hunter College. Teaching with Ruth Messinger is a trip because she has those students thinking in ways that I would never imagine. I think it's all because she's a social worker. She's also very smart. But anyway, um, so I learned a lot from her and that's another reason why I be believe in what you're doing. So. Hillary Cobble is a licensed clinical social worker. She's been working in New York City public schools for 15 years. She works with graduate and undergraduate social work students at her school, and I hope she'll talk about that. She's worked in the Bronx and Manhattan and with all levels, middle school, high school, and with a lot of young people who are immigrants. She speaks Spanish and Portuguese. I should have mentioned that Council Member Traeger, maybe I did, he speaks Russian. And she's worked with teens from really all over the world. Uh, she's worked at after school programs and domestic violence and alternative schools. Um, and she says here she loves New York City and she's passionate about helping young people. And I think that's true of all of the amazing panelists. So Hillary, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And again, thank you, Borough President Brewer, because um, when I met you, I don't know, 20 or so years ago, you were doing this passionate work of amplifying the voice of the youth that I've been working with. And your passion is still strong, uh, however many years later. Um, and it gives dignity to the students that I work with, because in my building, we all are passionate and working hard because um, we see the potential of our students and you're helping shine a light on all those students who are so passionate about working with every day. And thank you to all the other panelists for your comments and council member um, Traeger, you know, I work as well with international students and the story that you told really resonates because we have very, very similar cases. And um, I'm going to take this time to share some stories about some of our students, especially um, during this time because most of the issues that are arising are issues that we had before. They're just, as you said, um, exacerbated now. So once this started happening, my phone was ringing a lot from the teachers because we have very passionate teachers at my school and I'm getting emails like finances needed, food needed. And I'm kind of like, okay, we got to get food to these families like right now, you know, food running out. Uh, money running out, cell phone bill can't be paid, rent can't be paid. And so we all kind of 
we're scrambling to figure out how to help the students. And one silver lining that's come out of that is one social worker isn't enough. We actually have two and we have a lot of interns, but even that's not enough. And we only have 360 students, um, but it's a high needs population. So now the teachers are stepping up and they're creating mutual aid efforts to help the students. They're fundraising to get deliveries of groceries, et cetera. So it's really been a team effort. And another beautiful thing that's happened is um, teachers are really owning their students to the next level beyond what was happening before like certain what we call ltas long-term absence kids who we struggle to like keep coming to school you know maybe me or an intern or the other social worker is kind of a lifeline for them but what's happening is the advisory system they're now responsible for attendance and following up with these students so you know i might have three cell phone numbers saved in my phone and you know this one you can reach by whatsapp this one you can only reach on Messenger. This one you can, you know, has a good reliable phone number. This one's mom is here, or you can reach their parent in Ecuador, whatever it might be. I might know all those nuances, but now the teachers need to know them as well. And so it's been more of a collaborative effort now. Um, but what I can say is that for one, economic pressures are clearly a, a serious stressor right now. Um, we have many of our students are essential workers, um, but many of them were working in these same industries before full time and going to school. The difference is now that there's more pressures. Um, they're working seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day. So as an example, we have a, a senior from Guatemala who's all set to graduate. He's very bright. He's passed all his regents right away. All his credits are in line. He's trying to pay back $6,000 of debt. And um, he's working He's working six days a week. So he has that one day a week where we're like, all right, well, what can you get done, you know, on that one day a week? Um, but, you know, there, there's self-care and stress and trauma. And I also know he's someone who gets easily overwhelmed and stressed out. And where I see, you know, all the efforts and the, like, I've been at my school for nine years. So I've known these kids for a long time. And so there's already this trust and relationship that we've built that when I call them, they kind of, even though we can't see each other, we've had these conversations before. And so now it's like, all right, you've run 25 miles. This is the last mile, you know, let's do this. Um, and, you know, we also have students who weren't, weren't necessarily working full time before that were like our superstar students who now they're like, sorry, school, you know, I got I got to work. Um, and that's also led to some difficult choices with colleges. We have students choosing not to go away because like, like you said, council member, um, turning down scholarships, you know, Bard College, we have a student who's turning it down because they said, if I leave, my parents are going to need to rent the room now and I don't want to have no room to come home to and that's scary and I need to be home and I need to be with my family. Um, we also, mental health clearly is a role we've always played. So. When all the teachers were emailing me about food, I was like, okay, yes, food is a crisis. But first, I'm thinking about all the kids we just brought to the ER for suicidal ideation or all the cases we just called into the state for child abuse and now knowing, oh my God, these kids are stuck at home now. Um, let me, let's make sure those kids are okay or as best as they can be okay. Um, so we also have had students who didn't necessarily have a lot of mental health concerns before. They were very engaged in school that all of a sudden, like, you know, we had to call mobile crisis unit for a student who has never bleeped off our radar before because now she is um, super stressed and feeling isolated and school was her touchstone, touchstone and now she doesn't have it. And so, you know, we're kind of the ones that the teachers reach out to on off hours. Like I saw this post on Instagram, you know, I don't want to live, what should I do? Um, and we have to make those judgment calls now from afar. Um, students that, you know, we have had loss and bereavement um, counseling that's been happening. A few people have lost family members. We also, have, because it's an international population, also they're thinking about family in other countries. Like for example, um, our Ecuadorian students, I have one, um, actually she's alumni whose um, mother is mentally ill and she's very concerned about her mother being able to get the medication she needs for her stability. Um, technology has been a big challenge that the social workers have been helping with. You know, we were talking before the Zoom about, you know, our Zooms get messed up and our audio and our video. And I'm like, we have these SIFE students who have not never really been in school, don't necessarily know the alphabet. And it's like, here's this iPad, figure it out. And 
our teachers are really doing their best to help, but it's a big challenge we have on our hands that social workers also were the ones who were kind of linking and providing the, that direct support for students. Um, and even this, this whole setup of Zoom, like a lot of kids don't want their face on a screen or they don't want you to see the background or who, or do they have privacy, you know, to have a conversation with a counselor or with a teacher. Um, and we have kids kind of like falling off the map a bit. Like we're, we're really hustling to do everything we can to keep our kids engaged and utilizing those social worker relationships that we have, you know, texting, calling, we can't go to their house like we used to. We used to do anything. We go to their house, we find them in the classroom. Um, you go to the parents' place of work, whatever it takes. And so we're, we're still doing our best to do that. Um, and you know, kids' habits are changing. So these are all things we're gonna have to deal with when we get back, you know, sleeping more, being on screens more, um, you know, depression and anxiety is definitely wor worsens. Um, so now more than ever, you know, we need the work that we do. I'm pretty overwhelmed thinking about the idea of going back in any form, um, even though we have such a supportive community. And we also, like Yale mentioned, we have social work interns, a big team of them, because I speak Spanish and Portuguese. I don't speak Arabic. I don't speak Wolof. I don't speak Bambara. I don't speak Bengali. I don't speak French. So we find interns who speak all those languages and that person is the hub for those students so that we can find out what's going on. You know, I, I don't think I'd be able to very successfully access um, really what's going on with a lot of the students without a common language. And then the families also feel a lot more comfortable when they come to school and they have someone who kind of understands the culture, speaks their native language. And these interns also do groups. So we have different cultural groups for all the um, populations. And the teachers really rely on these interns as well. Um, they're still asking me, can the interns do this? Can the interns do this? And I'm like, well, they're volunteering now. Their school is done, but um, they're still, they're, they actually are still volunteering to be there for the students because they're very committed to, to it, especially during these times. Um, so I know that the role that we play in the school is essential. It's, in, it's indispensable. The teachers rely on us, the students rely on us. We've shaped school culture so that it's a safe place. Um, if students have issues, they, they know they come to our office and we're gonna help them. We're gonna prevent any problems. We're gonna help their families. Their families can come, the teachers can come. Um, we also help the teachers sort of see things differently. Like, so and so is falling asleep in class. Well, so and so also, you know, gets home at two in the morning because they're working to support their family. Let's figure out what we could do. Um, so and so, you know, needs to take more responsibility. So and so is an unaccompanied youth who actually is 16 years old and has a full time job. He knows a lot about responsibility. Let's just help him balance things out. Um, we provide wraparound services in our school. So in addition to just keeping kids in school, which I know that we do. I know that if we weren't there, a lot of our students would no longer be there. I am positive of it. So now this new challenge, all right, we still need you to stay even though we can't see you and it's harder and you have more pressures. Um, at our school, we have a dental van that comes to the school once a month. We take the students to get eyeglasses. We have a food pantry. We have a clothing pantry. We help them get health insurance. We help them meet with immigration lawyers. We really try to address all their needs, help them find enrichment opportunities after school programs, jobs, et cetera. So um, I, I also wanna say that I feel like um, social workers in school are, are indispensable. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I also really like the model where social workers are part of the DOE staff because I know that I get more buy-in from the teachers because I'm, I'm one of them, I'm one of the staff, I'm not an outside agency. The outs we have an outside agency in our building and they're indispensable. They provide health services, mental health services, they're a great partner for us. And I, I am grateful though for the opportunity to work for the DOE and be part of the DOE staff. Thank you again for everything. Well, I want to thank you, and it, it is interesting because most of the uh, questions that are coming in on the questions relate to the following. They want to know, uh, three or four principals are writing, and they state, I don't have a social worker in my school. It was bad enough not having a social worker pre-virus. I'm not going to be able to survive without a social worker now that the virus has hit all my families. So I guess I want to start with you, Councilmember, although it's uh, 
challenging. Uh, do you think that this pandemic will give us, if I called, I don't really like the world silver lining because when we have 20,000 people have died, there's no silver lining. But the hope that maybe this pandemic will alert the powers that be that we need social workers full time, culturally appropriate in every school. And again, the other on the uh, chat box, so to speak, is how do I make that happen, which I know everybody's been trying, but everybody should chime in. We know the need and we just need to know how we're going to go about it or what do you think some of the changes are that a social worker would have to deal with and why that person is needed in the future. So, Borough President, I, I appreciate, first of all, the comments we've heard are so powerful and I was taking notes on them as well. And uh, how do we make this happen? I just, to give some context, uh, New York City right now is in a uh, significant budget hole. Um, all in total, uh, with this fiscal year and the next fiscal year, there is estimates of around an $8 billion in growing budget hole. The state of New York passed the budget that was painful, and uh, we're being told that uh, any day, any moment, uh, we will get more information on a $2 billion additional cut to the city that will hit schools and hospitals. Can you imagine hitting hospitals in a, in a pandemic and hitting schools? So. The, the budget situation is very serious. Um, we are aware and we, we appreciate the House, members of Congress who are who advance, we're advancing the HEROES Act, which would appropriate billions of dollars to New York, direct aid to the city and to the state, but the fight goes to the Senate. Having said that, in, at my budget hearing with the Chancellor the other day, I, I made clear my priority as education chair. Those closest to the struggle must be farthest from the pain. This budget ahead will determine whether the, whether the trauma our kids are now experiencing with this pandemic will be temporary or generational. They will never get back the lost instruction. They'll never get back loved ones and teachers that they've lost due to this pandemic. But we can decide as a city uh, to help get them back uh, to, to a sense where of, of baseline. And there were kids that were before, there were shortchanged before the pandemic that we, that, that their, that their quest to base on is even that much more daunting. So we have identified a lot of money in the budget that we think should be reprioritized. I think last year, Borough President, if you remember, I fought tooth and nail to reprioritize money away from some consultants that were not licensed social workers, that were not licensed therapists, towards more supports to hire the social workers. Some of the 85 clinical social workers that were hired as a result of the budget agreement that was money that was reprioritized away from some consultants who cannot do this type of critical work. You need licensed people to do this work. So that's the budget situation now. We're advancing in our budget negotiations, but to me, the goal must be uh, not just the social worker, but the adequate number of supports for our kids now more than ever. But we need help from the city, state, and Washington to make that happen. So is, anybody can jump, maybe Dr. Lindsay, you want to start, but uh, some of the people on the chat room are saying, how can we, interestingly enough, because they want social workers, message better, like you are doing, what social workers do. And, and of course, if we're not experiencing it, maybe people don't understand how messaging is already happening in my head, but that's one question. And then the other question is, what's the best practice for social workers in schools and how can they be better supported. I get that, but Partnership is already doing a great job. Henry Street's doing a good job. I'm sure Hillary's doing a great job, but I just don't, didn't know if it, McSilver, if you hear, you know, challenges in terms of how social workers are supported. And then second, do you think we do need a better messaging, that's not a word, a better message in terms of what social workers do in the schools in order to help the council member? Yes, a couple of thoughts about that, uh, Borough President. Um, one is that um, it would be a missed opportunity to place social workers in schools who are not equipped with uh, evidence-based interventions and strategies. Right. Uh, Council Member Traeger just talked about being licensed and that's really critical um, and obviously important for reimbursement purposes, right? But we have 
uh, evidence-based interventions and strategies that we know to be incredibly important to address um, you know, the presenting concerns that kids have, whether that's anxiety, uh, trauma, depression, disruptive behaviors or otherwise. And so again, from what I know about what is happening with respect to school mental health personnel, we are tra training them. Um, and I give my hats off to Scott Bloom and his office and some of the work that they're doing around preparing uh, providers to deliver services. And again, we're working with them in partnership. Now, that's one thing, but if you're talking about general services um, in terms of what social workers can do, um, obviously case management services are important uh, and there is a, uh, a codification of strategies that are best practices with respect to case management um, that are really important. Um, whether this crisis management. And so what I'd like to see us move away from is sort of a crisis orientation and really uh, sort of forward a, um, a perspective around prevention services, which social workers are equipped and able to do. I talked about the step-up model that we implement at McSilver. That is an example of a prevention service uh, that uh, social workers can be trained on to deliver that focuses on mental wellness and other supports that keeps those kids connected to schools who are likely to be on the cusp of dropping out, right? So there are examples of things that we can do, and we certainly are putting forth some of those examples in our work at McSilver. Um, and so the messaging is that we know what works, if we can train those social workers and other providers on those models, then we have an opportunity to meet the needs of kids. That's the message. Yeah. So Jasmine, you're in the school and you're supervising community schools. Um, I guess it's somewhat the same question. How do you support your social workers so they can support the families and the students? Mm -hmm. And um, are we okay on our message to help the council member? Yes, I think, you know, in a, it, in addition to providing the clinical supervision, I think what's important is making sure that our leadership at schools um, are bought into the, to the model, you know, that they value social work and see the importance of social work and that it becomes an integrated service, um, meaning that it is a team approach, right? It's not just the social workers handling the crises and the things that are coming up, but that as a school community, we are partners in this work and that there are forms and opportunities for um, you know, the, the proper structures that get set up in place to make sure that we're working together as a team, that social workers are getting adequate training, that social workers are able to provide training to the staff in the school building, not just the teachers. We're talking about the paras, the security guards, all personnel that work in the school, that we're also creating you know, effective relationships with our families as well. Um, because when you're working with young people, you're working with families. Um, you know, in addition, I think ca space capacity is another issue. Making yeah. sure that if we're going to have social workers in school, that they have an adequate space in which to hold such intimate and vulnerable therapeutic components, right? Um, and valuing and honoring that space. Um, and making sure that it's a designated space, that they're not going to get interrupted when they are, you know, unpacking a lot of sensitive things. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Very important. So David, um, I guess it's somewhat the same question. I do get complaints that sometimes, not in your schools perhaps, but it, where there isn't a backup of partnership or uh, Henry Street, that the buy-in isn't there, as Jasmine just stated. In other words, the social worker is all by him or herself and the principal who knows nothing about social work is telling that person what to do. But in your case, because you are there. So my question is similar. How do you support your social workers so they can help the families? And also, are we okay on the uh, message? And pitch, picking up on what uh, Jasmine suggested is that that is, uh, do you get buy-in from the principals? Yeah, we're fortunate to have some extraordinary relationships with the principals and schools that we're in. And I think the best case for messaging uh, was made by Hillary and Jasmine. Social workers save lives. Social workers are essential. You would never think of opening a school without a principal or without a teacher or without a nurse 
or without some of the facilities. We should never think of opening a school without a social worker. I know that my team at Henry Street are the most extraordinary caring group of clinicians that you could ever want connected to your students and your family. We take every opportunity to support them and we've been doing so increasingly. We pay for every continuing education credit. We bring them on site so they can continue to develop um, to get the skills and training that they need. We have a scholarship program where um, uh, interns or people who are still in school can apply for a scholarship through Henry Street Settlement. We try to prop them up with professional development opportunities. We have uh, two of our school-based, uh, well, well, one of our school-based social workers and another social worker are social work liaisons to the rest of the agency, and they help direct and design trainings and supports because the fact of the matter is uh, they are as essential as any other component of a school. And as far as the timing goes right now, I think that this crisis should not be wasted. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, every, any crisis is tragic, uh, but this is not a flood. This is not a hurricane. This is a human crisis. This is uh, a trauma inflicting uh, crisis that we're in now. And so in as much as we um, can embrace all the needs that our children and families have before a circumstance or situation like this, uh, I think even now the city needs to double down on human services. It's not a time, uh, and as much as I um, am somewhat understanding of the budget shortfalls, uh, I think it's a question of allocating resources where uh, the city's values and the city's principles are. And I think human services, including social workers, has to lead the pack. Uh, I, obviously, you know, public health and safety are, um, are extraordinarily pressing at this moment, but the city has to invest in human services and the organizations that are the relationships that bridge to the families and children in the communities that are most impacted right now by this pandemic. I mean, many of us, especially in the settlement house system, we work in communities of color, we work in low-income communities. That is the community that's being most impacted at this point in time. So it's an everyday argument to invest in human services. I think it's an exponentially increased argument to invest in human services now when they're needed the most. And uh, I think absolutely every school needs a social worker, just like every school needs all the other roles that we mentioned. Okay. Hello, we have to wrap up soon, but I guess my question is, we have talked about now and we know the future is very unpredictable, but this pandemic has raised uh, so many issues. We've talked about some of them, there are many more. How do you see September? We don't know whether the schools are open. The governor's office just said they don't know. Um, how do, what do you look at and when you see September and the work that you're doing? Um, I'm starting to try to wrap my head around it. Um, we've been sampling some new strategies now, like meeting students where they're at, so to speak, which is a mantra of social work. So, you know, one of the counselors does an Instagram live kind of to help keep the kids entertained and connected to school. And we'll have special guest stars, like different teachers, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm amazed thinking about doing crisis assessment from far away. Um, and especially with students we don't know, like our new students, our ninth grade students, um, and yeah. making sure that we're, we, it, it's, a, it's a hard line finding safety that's helpful versus safety that's intrusive and can exacerbate issues. Um, and it's, it's an art and um, you know, we're good at it and, we're, and we do it in person and we know the students and we know the context and we know the families. So we're gonna need to find ways to do that in this new capacity possibly. Um, and then there's you know, privacy issues and um, teletherapy issues that we need to kind of wrap our heads around as well. Um, and how do we still show the same care and love and intimacy and community bonds with our students and keep that strong school culture that makes it a safe place? And Dr. Lindsay, you were talking about prevention and I feel like that's key and we've been, we're, we, we've gotten to a great place with that. You know, as an immigrant population, we have over 90% attendance. And when we started hearing about COVID, you know, they said, well, maybe we should like scale back on rewarding, perfect attendance. And I was like, oh, I know we need to, but it was painful because we've been doing so great with it. You know, we had all, have all these reward trips to go to Broadway shows and all these things lined up. Um, so how do we still maintain our school culture um, and community virtually 
and find creative ways. Cause also sometimes we text the kids, how are you doing? Good. Um, what's going on? How's this week? Or what about this class? And then you don't hear from them again. And it's like, are they okay? What's going on? And so we need to find creative ways to keep the conversation going. Like, okay, well maybe I'll, I'll send an audio. Maybe I'll do a video of myself. Maybe I'll send them a funny meme. You know, we have to get more creative in how to outreach to them. And of course, provide them with essential needs that they that the families need to just survive as well. And also keep education as a priority. You know, survival comes first. We have Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And no student that has ever dropped out that I've seen really wanted to. It was mostly because of poverty issues and work and um, other kinds of pressures. And so and now, you know, how do we keep their identity as, as I am a student, you know? Um, in the face of this with other pressures. I can't imagine a better panel. And, and I think the council member, uh, you've seen a lot of panels, but thank you very much to council member Mark Traeger. Thank you to Jasmine Berrios, to David Garza, to Dr. Michael Lindsay, and to Hillary Koppel, who is uh, the high school uh, social worker, just like everybody else, unbelievable. So thank you all very much. And um, I think somebody said it best, we need a social worker in every school. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.